Welcome to another edition of Foreign Affairs Focus. I'm Gideon Rose, the editor of Foreign Affairs, and I have the privilege of being here with Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist, director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, author of the forthcoming book Space Chronicles, and of the lead article in the next issue of Foreign Affairs, The Case for Space. So, Neil, what is The Case for Space? Well, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to have this. you here. The, I think The Case for Space is well, there's the article as it appears in the journal, but the, it, it's drawn from the book, and the book is my attempt to try to get people thinking rationally about the forces that enable us to explore space and the reasons for doing so in the first place. Because the community of space enthusiasts and those who are not space enthusiasts, they, they don't understand the true drivers of what it is that sends us into space. Why should people care about the space program? Well, it's an excellent question. Let me preface this by saying the original title of the book was Failure to Launch the Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. And the publisher said, no, that's too depressing. We have to. <laughs> uh, but part of the analysis there is recognizing that, well, uh, people look at space. It's quite visible expenditure of national funds. And people say, well, why are we spending money up there? And we have problems down here, and we need social programs. Well, take a look at the budget of the United States of America, and you will find that we spend a factor of 50 more on social programs and on education than we do on NASA. So for the people to say, don't spend that up there, spend it on these other programs, well, you're making a 1 50th of a difference in that other budget. Do you really think that's going to change the world in that way? But what does space do? Space, if you dream big in space, I'm not talking about boldly going where hundreds have gone before into low Earth orbit. I'm talking about real destinations, real audacious steps to advance a space frontier. When you do that, it affects a cultural outlook on what it is to embrace science, technology, engineering, and math, the, the proverbial STEM fields. And there's all this talk, oh, we need, we need more scientists and more engineers. And people have this sort of egos to be solution in their head. They say, we need more scientists, let's get better science teachers. Okay, we're done. No, it doesn't work that way. That's a start. But when they come out the other end of the pipeline and they need a place to apply whatever excitement that may have been born within the educational, uh, uh, within their educational career, if there's nothing no place for them to take it, there's, nothing happens. So it the, falls on fallow ground. So the space program is not just about going into space, it's also the tent pole for America's revitalization of science? I would say that in the 1960s, we went into space because we were at war, even though our memory tells us differently. We think of that time as, oh, we were explorers, we were discoverers. You look at the rhetoric from John Kennedy, the same speech where he said, Let's put a man on the moon and return him safely, safely to Earth. Go a few paragraphs earlier than that. And what you'll find is where he says, we need to, sh to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny, because we just got bested by Yuri Gagarin having just gone into orbit six weeks before that speech. So one way we dream big is because we feel we are at risk of dying. Okay, that's the I don't want to die driver for spending money. No one wants that to be the prevailing reason for why you'd go into space. But there are others. The, the high road is it is great to explore. But I'll take the low road if I have to. And the low road is if you explore big and you pump the educational pipeline with students who are interested in taking up these fields because they see great things are happening for having done so, you transform your culture. And by doing so, you transform your economy. Innovations in science and technology have been the drivers of, they've been the engines of economic growth ever since the Industrial Revolution. Every nation who has embraced that fact since then has led the world. So is this what Newt Gingrich is saying about his case for the space program? There's a dimension of it in his rhetoric. Uh, what I found interesting was most people saying, oh, he's just dreaming. Well, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with dreaming. <laughs> dreaming is good. And here he is saying, we're going to put colonies on the moon by the end of his second term, I think like, the ambitious uh, uh, sense of himself there. But that is not more ambitious than John Kennedy saying, let's put a man on the moon before the decade is out. Because we had never even been to the moon yet. We didn't even have a vehicle that could 
take a human being safely into orbit yet at the time he made that, that famous speech. So for Gingrich to say, let's put colonies on the moon when we've already been to the moon, that's not a stretch of engineering. Back then, people, remember this, uh, how old are you? you, you <laughs> too, back then, too young to remember. <laughs> too young to remember. I remember. Uh, back then, when people thought what was possible and what wasn't, it was always in the context of whether we could do it technologically or scientifically. No longer. If anyone says, we're not going to put bases on the moon, it's not because they don't think we can, we can do it technologically. It's because they don't think we can do it culturally or economically or the spirit isn't there, the, the political will or the drive. I'm simply saying that when you recognize the value of an economic driver, because war and money, these are the two things that drive major expenditures in the history of human culture. You list the most expensive things we've ever done as people. At, at Homo sapiens, what have we done? Built the pyramids, the Great Wall of China, the Columbus voyages, the Magellan, just make a, make a list. The cathedral building, and, and make a list. There will only be three drivers that exist that account for why people did all of those things. One of them is the I don't want to die driver. That's the war. We already discussed that. The other one is I don't want to die poor. It's the prospect of gaining wealth. The third one, which we don't see much today, is, is the praise of royalty or deity. It has less of an influence on the actions of the expenditures of nations today than it once did. But that's how you get the pyramids and you get the cathedrals and things. So the Apollo project was a war project. Let's be honest with ourselves about that. NASA was created in a climate of war, October 1958. Were it not for Sputnik, let's remind ourselves again, Sputnik? Oh, there was just a little orbiter, oh, that's fine. That Sputnik was a beeping radio device in the hollowed out shell of an intercontinental ballistic missile. What a signal that was. So is China supplying that kind of motive today? Well, you know, again, you don't want war to be the driver because we do have other drivers we can appeal to. It just takes a little longer to explain why that would work as a driver. But yeah, if we view China as a threat, you know, you know all it takes to have China say, we want to build military bases on Mars. We'll be in Mars in 15 months. Has the Obama administration set Mars as a target? Mars is a target under the Obama administration. And what got Obama into hot water was a very simple statement that he made, which, and I was at the speech at Kennedy Space Center when he gave it. Very simple, he said, you know, we've already been to the moon. I, I don't need to go back there. Let's set our sights to Mars. And that got an applause, sure. But then you get a pause for a minute and say, well, wait a minute. We were already sort of gearing up to go back to the moon. So what happens to all those people and all those jobs and all the, the, the engineering that was going into that? Well, that all gets put aside. Tens of thousands of people lost their job out of that very simple sentence. Let's just skip the moon and go to Mars. So now, when are we going to land on Mars? Well, sometime, and we've got to innovate some more technologies for that, sometime in the 2030s. So here's the problem. We live in an era now where a president makes a promise that now has to be kept by some president to be named later. Now, where is the, where is the continuity of that political um, inertia Kennedy, when he said, let's put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the decade is out, he, if he had a second term, it would have happened under his second term. The Apollo 1 fire delayed the program about 22 months. Had that fire not taken place, we would have landed on the moon under Kennedy's watch. So I don't know what it means for a president, as Obama did, to promise something that is several presidential elections beyond his reach. Obama comes to you and says, okay, I've read your piece, I hear what you're saying, what should I do instead? What we need to do, we need a way to convey to people that some solutions take multiple steps and are sort of non-linear in their effect. Not all solutions are, I have a problem, you take this medicine, everything is fine. We want to boost our economy. What are ways to do that? You can say, we've got to innovate. Well, what are ways to stimulate innovation? Yeah, you can put money directly. I can hand you a check and say, go find a cure for cancer or find a solution. Well, OK, but you know what that does? That brings about incremental advances because you have your body of knowledge and you have a, your grant money, and then you increment from where you were to where we will become. 
The greatest discoveries in the history of our species come about when smart people are given the latitude to think freely in whatever way soothes their interest in cosmic knowledge. So the space program can be the tentpole for the entire scientific enterprise, which can give manifold benefits in various different ways. You just said what I said in one sentence. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you very much. <laughs> Read Foreign Affairs. We'll see you in the next issue. Thank you.